What we'd like to talk about on Friday is this idea that carbonyls with a leaving group attached may be substituted as opposed to adding to them. And this will be a key element for the rest of the term in terms of what's to come. It's just a lot of busy stuff. There's no, not really any new mechanisms. It's just a lot of recognizing what's going to happen and trying to keep on track. Um, we looked at this slide, I think, and we talked about uh, adding an alcohol to an acid chloride in the presence of pyridine. Now, in recitation, we'll do this in a bit more detail, but the whole point here is that the pyridine is there to mop up the acid that's formed. If you look at the balance of the equation at the top, I've got HCl coming off. I need to mop that up. And we've got to be careful here because we could argue about deprotonation versus no deprotonation. And we'd say that pyridine isn't really strong enough to deprotonate an alcohol. If you think about the pKa's of the different acids there. Uh, so this pyridine here will come in in the second step. It will come in afterwards and mop up the pyridine, mop up the, the proton. So the acid chloride, again, is the same sort of thing we dealt with last week. We've got this leaving group attached. We have a nucleophilic alcohol, not a strong nucleophile, but the acid chlorides and the anhydrides are reactive enough for this to work. And we get swapping of the OR group for the CL. Very useful method for making esters. What you'll find now is that there really isn't much difference in what we're going to do. It's just keeping a track of it and keeping it all organized. And the mechanisms will be pretty much the same. So down here in examples, we've got the possibility now of a simple primary alcohol with an acid chloride to give an acyl derivative. I believe you're going to do the acylation of glucose in labs, so you'll do something similar to, similar to this. Uh, the pyridine again is there as a, um, a, a solvent possibly, and also as a base to pick up a proton. Down at the bottom, some selectivity possibilities. You have a secondary alcohol versus a primary alcohol. Especially if you run this at room temperature, you might be able to just uh, acylate the primary alcohol, and you can end up with a, a derivatized product that is somewhat selective. So then we moved into, or we will move into today, this idea of using different types of nucleophile on the acid chloride. And it's going to be the same mechanism. You're going to find the nucleophile, you're going to identify it as being something that can attack, and then we're going to kick out the chlorine. So mechanistically for this, we would imagine we have ammonia here, and ammonia has a lone pair, so I ought to put that on there. And that then is a nucleophile or a base. The electrophile here is going to make it react as a nucleophile. And you'll answer the question, why do we need two equivalents? Well, the first equivalent will go in, and it will kick this up to here, and it will form a tetrahedral intermediate, which will collapse loss of the chloride, but overall loss of HCl. We're not into 23 yet. 23 is the chemistry of amines, but it should be fairly obvious by now. This material here is a nucleophile and a base. So instead of making it complicated by adding a second base, like pyridine, why not just use two equivalents of the amine? One equivalent is a nucleophile, the other equivalent is the base. So the first equivalent kicks out the chlorine and produces this with the extra proton attached, and then the second equivalent of the amine comes in, in this case ammonia, and it grabs that proton. It serves the same purpose that pyridine would, just keeping it simple because these are cheap materials, and then you get the product by deprotonation like that. So fairly simple, this nucleophilic acyl substitution. You can change this, you can make different types of materials by changing the type of amine you're using. If you use just straight ammonia, you can make this type of amid. If you're using this type, which is a primary amine, you'll get swapping for this type of primary amid, where we have one R group attached. That will be incredibly important to you in biochemistry. And then down at the bottom, organic chemists like to do this type of thing, acid chloride with a leaving group attached, two equivalents again of this secondary amine, and we end up with a disubstituted NN dialkylated amide. So it's versatile. You can make esters this way, you can make amides this way. And you'll find that today, and Wednesday when we finish this off, some things are very logical. You go from chlorides to amides. You don't go from amides to chlorides. You go from chlorides to esters. You don't go from esters to chlorides. Right? You're going to the more stable thing, because this is all driven by equilibria, and it's driven by wanting to go to the more stable product. Typically, amides are more stable than esters, and then the other two, the uh, chlorides and the anhydrides, are, are used to go to those products, to go to esters and amides. So thinking about things we've already seen, we, we did touch on this a while back in the early, maybe chapter 13 a while back. Taking something like an acid chloride, which has a leaving group attached, and treating it with a powerful nuclear file like hydride, like H-, minus, you would expect this to come off. Yeah? Now, if anybody's seeing the mechanism here, without necessarily looking at the bottom of the slide, what do you think the intermediate product is? If you bring in H- and kick out a chloride, what's the intermediate product? Aldehyde. It's an aldehyde, right? And what do you know about aldehydes and their reactivity versus esters? They're more reactive, right? So th th it should make sense now. So on the bottom, we've got the mechanism. We've got H- again coming in in the form of ALH4-. The, the charge is definitely on the hydrogen. And that serves as a powerful nucleophile. And what would we call this? tetrahedral intermediate, absolutely, and make it collapse, lose the leaving group. Too many people get stuck at this place because they haven't studied enough, and then they, they lose points further downstream because they don't know what, what the intermediate product is. You've got to make sure this thing comes off. Then we have more hydride, okay? And then you can see here they have used the word excess to make sure that you recognize that. You have a, a substrate that is able to be reduced by lithium aluminum hydride, as it always was, and so we can go ahead and do that again. So I have two mechanisms here. In fact, I have three if I include the acid-base quench step at the end. 
And that's all we'll do from now to the end of the term, is mix these things together and sort of put them in series to make new systems. So in that first step, what is the mechanism from here to here? Nucleophilic acyl substitution. And then what is the mechanism from here to here? Nucleophilic addition. You need to be able to see this quickly. You need to be able to see this. So we're adding something, and there's no leaving group here anymore, right? The leaving group is gone, so we can't replace it. So we get a second hydrogen added. And like we did with the esters a while back, you get a primary alcohol. The last step is a protonation, a quench step. You neutralize the system, and you end up with a primary alcohol. So the people who are making note cards or study sheets, whatever you want, acid chloride, just like an ester, is going to give you a primary alcohol the same way, in fact, the same mechanism. So look at that and try to organize yourselves. Try to make sure that you're not overdoing this and not just sort of everything's a bunch of noise. It isn't. It's organized and you can keep it uh, quite simple if you take the time. So chemists like to invent things that are selective. We like to invent things to solve problems. And let's say we don't want the acid chloride to reduce all the way to the primary alcohol. We did this with PCC and PDC when we wanted to stop at the aldehyde in the opposite sense by oxidation. This is a reagent in the opposite sense in which we're reducing and introducing hydride but it turns out this stops at the aldehyde. That's very useful. That's a very simple synthesis of an aldehyde from an acid chloride. And again, I keep talking about the families. I talk about the aldehydes and ketones as one family with no leaving group attached, and then the derivatives of carboxylic acids as a separate family. And you have to be able to go between them. And this is an example of how, how we can go from essentially a carboxylic acid to an aldehyde. We haven't seen anything like that before. So if you had a carboxylic acid, you can mix it with SO2, SOCl2, you can make the acid chloride, and then you can introduce this species, right? Lithium tritibutoxy aluminium hydride. And what's unique about this reagent compared to what we started with here? Okay, there's LAH. Here is this new reagent. What's different? Only one hydrogen, okay? And this works. The mechanism here isn't quite as simple as it looks, but it does work, and you're going to end up with, in this case, an aldehyde by stopping at the aldehyde. So you don't have that second equivalent of the hydride in there, and it's not going to be able to reduce further. So we can see now this. I'm not going to ask you to, to worry too much about um, uh, the overall mechanism for that, but there's the reagent. If you see that one hydrogen, you know it's selective, and therefore you can swap out a chlorine for a hydrogen, and that gives you the product. Now, the clue is with the second step, the water, the hydration, you need that in there to be able to work this thing. You often to be able to make the intermediate collapse. So it's not quite as obvious as it looks. Very useful because you have selectivity. You can stop halfway now. You don't have to go all the way to the primary alcohol. We did this, something similar to it, a while back when we took esters. I think it was in 13, uh, maybe 14. And then we started adding excess nucleophile. In this case, we should be happy with the fact that these additions are now not reversible. If you add H minus or you add C minus up, to, to, up so far, the C won't break back off. The C nucleophile is a lousy leaving group, so it won't break back off. So when you think about mechanisms here, I would hope that people who are wanting Bs and As in the class should be able to have a go at this from scratch without necessarily having to memorize it. So we know we have a powerful nucleophile. There's a clue here for the excess. That tells you it probably goes a couple of times in terms of adding to the system. And then finally here, we'll do a quench workup and we'll get the product out. So what happens here is chloride breaks off and we end up with two R groups attached. You always get a tertiary alcohol. That was the same for esters a while back. So the first step is simply the R nucleophile adding to the carbonyl and forming this. That's your tetrahedral intermediate again in a nucleophilic acyl substitution. And this collapses and it gives you the ketone. With the hydride, you introduced H, you got an aldehyde. With this, you introduce C, you get a ketone, a little bit different. And now we can see the use of the second equivalent of the grignard coming from here, and that gives you the tertiary alkoxide. And then the last step here, you simply quench. Nothing new there. That's something we have done and we have seen. Your job is to keep it all straight. Well, it would be useful if we can do similar things to stop at the ketone, and these have been developed. Again, the mechanism is probably more complicated than we have time for. But you can do this. You need to know this reagent. We will spend more time on cuprates in the next chapter when we get to 22. They are very useful because we can tame, okay? We can control the reactivity of the carbon group attached by changing the metal. And this is a huge field called organometallics. And a lot of people these days in organic chemistry go and get a PhD in organic organometallics because they are such powerful reagents. They help you form carbon-carbon bonds uh, very nicely. So cuprates, as opposed to the magnesium reagents, these aren't as reactive. They're not as nucleophilic. And it turns out we can control this, and we can stop after one reaction in which we do nucleophilic acyl substitution, replacing Cl with methyl in this case, and you can stop at the ketone. Again, mechanistically, take a graduate class or take an advanced class, uh, maybe 5821 in the fall. Uh, if you're looking for classes in the fall, you, you like this stuff, take Dr. Jackson's Intermediate Organic, 5821. 
It's a really good preparation for pre-med, pre-pharmacy. If you, if you might have forgotten this stuff after a while, that keeps you ticking along. It's a really, really good class. So here we go. We've now got a method to take uh, acid chloride to an aldehyde, and we have a method to take an acid chloride to a ketone. We are really expanding the playing field in terms of what we can do, as that slide tells you quite nicely. Right, so these slides, for those of you who are into this stuff, should be starting to look kind of fun because you can do an awful lot now in terms of swapping out halides. The whole point of this slide is the centrality of this acid chloride. They are extremely versatile in terms of where you can take them. And once you're at these other places, we can go, as we know, all kinds of places. All right, so you have now a nice, nice way of taking the carboxylic acid family and turning it into esters, amides of all different types, and we can turn them into primary alcohols, we can turn them into tertiary alcohols, or we can turn them into um, aldehydes and ketones. So be careful here. This stuff is not very tricky. There's just a lot of it. But you should be used to that sort of thing by now. Anybody want to say anything? Kyle, are you well? Good. Food, are you well? You're happy. You just want to sit there and you're content and smile. Okay, that's fine. Right, moving along. Analogous to chlorides are the anhydrides. And I would argue that if you know what chlorides do, you also know what anhydrides do. Don't have to learn it twice. We now know that chloride's a good leaving group because it's electronegative. When it breaks off, it's large. It can handle a charge. Great. We've always been okay with that. Why should this be such a good leaving group? If it breaks off as a negative charge, what comes into play? Resonance delocalization. So these things are about as reactive as chlorides. If you have a bottle of anhydride and you leave it open and it's humid, it won't be anhydride much longer because it'll react with the water. So how do we make these things? Well, we've said the word anhydride means basically take a molecule of water out. So if you boil this stuff up on its own, maybe with some catalyst, maybe with some acid catalyst or something, at quite high temperature, you'll be able to remove a molecule of water. Two of these things will condense. I'll be using that word a lot in the next few weeks, condense. Huge amount of biology involves condensation reactions. So we're condensing this. The word condensation is ob obvious. If you know what condensation is, you know, you'll see on the distill distillation apparatus, you'll see the steam, you'll see the condensation happen where the word comes from, and you get rid of a molecule of water and you couple these two things together. So this is really two carboxylic acids that have been joined together. The molecule of water has been lost. If you get rid of that, you can drive the equilibrium to the right-hand side, and you have a nice synthesis. Now, if you use this in the lab, which I think you do in the next couple of weeks with the glucose, be very careful, right? It's caustic. It really is nasty stuff. So be very, very careful with that. Uh, you can also make them by this mechanism. You can start out with a salt of a carboxylic acid. Let's call it a carboxylate an acid chloride again, and we can end up again with an anhydride. So what's the mechanism there? Well, it says so at the bottom, doesn't it? Nucleophilic attack on the carbon, formation of this, what does that remind you of? Tetrahedral intermediate, starting to look very similar, just keep it, keep it tidy, and then loss of a chloride here, and we end up with that product over there. So very simple ways of doing this to get to some very, very useful materials. So the idea being that they are analogs of chlorides. Sometimes it's easier and cheaper to get the anhydride than it is to get the chloride. So you might have a choice of when to use what. Um, in this case, the leaving group is chloride. It's probably just as good as the anhydride leaving group, the acetate leaving group. And so we have uh, some, some useful materials now. And if you put that, is this any different to the last slide? No, it's not. If you swap out the chloride from that previous slide for the anhydride, it's exactly the same. It's trying to show you that these things are very powerful for going in different directions. Michael de Coley. You can use bromides. Acetyl bromides are okay, but they're quite reactive and difficult to work with. Iodides, I think, are probably too reactive and hydrolyze so quickly they're not much use. And fluorides, we don't really use the fluorides. Not a great leaving group. But yeah, but usually you go into an organic lab like mine up in, the, in Ward Beach there, We've got 15, 20 acid chlorides, yeah, because they are the cheapest and easiest to use. So lots of stuff moving along. We now have to worry about the uses of these things for other purposes. And you will, in the next week or two, I'm not sure when you do this, but it's all about glucose becoming glucose pentaacetate. I think you'll take glucose, which is a polyalcohol. You have a bunch of these OH groups attached, treat it with acetic anhydride, and end up with this. Now, what material is that? What's that type of product? That's an ester. And you can do exactly the same thing with an amine in, in place as the nuclear file, and you can end up with this. What's that? Amide. Okay, so it's an amide. You've got nice, some, nice versatility now. In other words, where you could use the acid chlorides, you can use the anhydrides in the same place. That's all there is to that. There's an experiment we used to do at the top. Um, for some reason, Dr. Jackson wants to do the glucose one this year, but aspirin is an easy one as well. You can see here there's one free hydroxyl on this benzene ring, a phenol. 
and in the presence of acetic anhydride, you can acetylate it, and you can make things like aspirin at the top, and if you do the same thing at the bottom with this amino phenol, you end up with Tylenol. So obviously it's got some use in terms of analgesics and, and pharmacy and medicine, and it's a very simple process that you will do in the next couple of weeks. But again, be very careful with that acetic anhydride. It really is nasty. Okay, now, what I want to get into today largely is esters. We can make them by acid chlorides, we can make them from acetic anhydride, stuff like that, but we have to know a lot about their reactions because they're very useful materials for polymers in industry and also for biological systems. Being able to make esters is key. So we've got some possibilities here of how we can link this oxygen to this carbon because that changes the carboxylic acid on the left into the ester on the right. It's fairly simple. And the argument is, well, how about just alkylating it? How about just taking this material, what would that do? It will deprotonate. And again, on quizzes, if, if there's a base there, it will probably deprotonate something. If there's an acid there, I'm guessing it would deprotonate something. So let's get good at that. Uh, this thing comes in, and it deprotonates there, and it makes an O- minus nucleophile. Now, this is OK for these simple systems. I have a methyl group, and I have an iodide. What's that mechanism? That's an SN2. Good. So the point here is that this is somewhat limited in terms of how you can use it. You've got to be very careful here. It doesn't work for crowded electrophiles, and it doesn't work for anything more complex than a primary system. Any ideas why? Why isn't this going to work too well for a secondary or tertiary system? It's not a strong nucleophile, but on the substrate end, or on the electrophile end, it's getting more crowded, right? Now, why is this a poor nucleophile? Yep, this charge is delocalized into that system. Any time you had that happen, you ended up with a weaker nucleophile. So the problem with this, with this system is it's limited to very active systems like iodides on a methyl or a very simple primary system. After you go after that uh, beyond there, you start to get into trouble. Things are getting too slow. So we can change that. And we can come up with one of the best mechanisms in the entire two-semester sequence, something called the Fischer esterification. The Fischer esterification isn't that tricky if you can make acetals. The problem is the mechanism looks an awful lot like the formation of an acetal. So if you're not on your game on the, on the exam day, you're not quite there, you can be doing the wrong mechanism. But even though it looks the same, they're not the same. So what we need to worry about now is carboxylic acid, some alcohol, and in this case it's the alcohol that is the source of the R group on the ester, and we need to swap one for the other. So let's see if we've got anything out to last week's quiz. What are you going to do first if this is present? Protonate something. Yes, please. Protonate something. So with that in mind, we can worry about a mechanism, and we're going to find that this is a very, very uh, fun mechanism in the sense that there are many steps to it, and you have to go backwards too. You have to understand why we're going forwards and why we're going backwards. And the Fischer esterification will help explain things like sodium dichromate oxidation. We'll do that in recitation this week to, to make sure we, we've covered all that. Uh, this now is, is, is great. So what we need to worry about is why we need the acid. It's a catalyst. You have a small amount of it, and you get it back. So that means in the mechanism, it should speed something up. Now, this carboxylic acid here on its own isn't that reactive. It isn't that electrophilic. Like any of the carbonyls from earlier chapters, if you protonate it, you make it more reactive. Now, what's missing from this picture that I like to put in there to show why it's reactive? Resonance structures, right? We'll see that again and again. I can see a couple of resonance structures for that molecule that show why it's a resonance stabilized carbocation. If that's the case, it needs electron density. That's what's being shown in this next step. In this case, the methanol is coming in and we're ending up with a tack, and we're forming this tetrahedral intermediate right here. So what is this now? What is happening here? This is kind of, we're taking a couple of steps here. What would we normally write in this class so far? H plus transfer, to avoid all of that noise. And if that's the case, one of the protons went from the methanol piece and ended up on an OH group to make that. What was the point of that? Leaving group. So let's break it off. And the difference now is if we break this thing off and we draw the resonance structures for this type of species, again, it's a resonance stabilized cation. That's why it's allowed. All we need to do at the end is to lose that proton, and we have an ester. Now, make a note of this. Put it next, put an asterisk on here or something. Compare this with the acetal formation and make sure you see the difference. After doing this for 20 years now, people don't see the difference. They do the wrong mechanism at the wrong time. And that's a bad thing, people. We'd rather not do that. So acetals look very similar. Esters, very, very similar. Make sure you know the difference. So I've got a system now which is uh, reversible. And I think in recitation we've been trying to organize why they are reversible and, and try to decide uh, how to make decisions about reversibility. If you look at the first step, you're picking a proton and you're putting it onto the oxygen. 
So that's an acid-base reaction. This is actually quite an acidic proton, so yes, we should be able to take it off and go back to the starter material. If we then make it through to the second step, is this a decent leaving group at the bottom? Yes, it is, because it's protonated. And if it comes off, it gives you a pretty good carbocation. So that reverse step is fine. Go on to the next step. Acid-base reaction, where we're taking off a proton from this three-valent oxygen, and we're making a three-valent oxygen. So they're about the same pKa, so that should be reversible. This guy, again, reversible. Down here, leaving group breaks off. Can it reattach? Yes, because this species needs electron density. And where is that water molecule as soon as it's broken off? It's still right next to the molecule it broke off from. It hasn't swum away. So it's right there, and it can go back, and it can attach. So we've got this problem, again, of going backwards and forwards. So how do you make this thing work? How do you make this go in the direction you want it down to that stuff right there? What do you need to do? Excess alcohol is a good one. Often it's the solvent because it's cheap and it's easy to do. And then remove the water at the other end. Because at the other end, don't forget, the byproduct is H2O. And if we can get rid of that, for example, maybe distillation might work if you're lucky. Or sequestration, for example, with a magnesium sulfate, sodium sulfate, something like that. Grab the moisture, grab the water, and it drags it to the right-hand side. So this, reacts, this works in very high yield and is a very useful method of going from a carboxylic acid to uh, an ester. And it's one that you absolutely have to be comfortable with because, again, it shows up later. Fair enough? I can fly through this as fast as you want. Okay, let's go. Now, how do you prove these things? How do you prove these mechanisms? In recitation, I'll spend a few minutes on this because I think it's kind of fun to know how people work these things out. And it's not just facts. It's all about working things out experimentally. So if you look on the, uh, the top, or at the top, you can see the carboxylic acid here is being reacted with methanol, but methanol has been labeled. Now, that methanol has been labeled maybe with oxygen that is, is 17 or 18, right? You think about oxygen being 16 atomic mass, you can put something in there that's uh, a label, an isotope, and you can follow where that thing shows up. Now, these are fun experiments to do. I had to do some of these when I was in DC before I came here, and we had to buy a milliliter of uh, 018 water or something like that. It's like $500 for one mil. So don't drop that one mil and don't waste it because your boss will be upset. Uh, but it's a very useful way of tracing what's happened in a reaction. You think about the mechanism here. Why not protonate this? One possibility is protonate this thing, make this into a good leaving group on the methanol, and then have this nuclear file come in and do that. That's an SN2 reaction. That's something that you're familiar with. Where would the label end up, with, end up in, in that system? In the water. The label would end up over here. Now, it turns out the label doesn't end up in the water, because you can isolate the water and take its mass spec, and you find out that it's not in there. It's just regular water. So the mechanism here is obviously something different. And we'll see now that the whole point of this is to take the proton and do exactly what we just did, protonate the carbonyl, bring in the methanol, trap it. And it turns out if you do that and use this as the nucleophile, and the carboxylic acid as the electrophile, that's how you get the label in the product. And you take the ester, boil it off, distill it, purify it, take it to the mass spec, and your label's in there. You can tell from the mass spec because it's two mass units higher than it should be. So that's how people work these things out. Very useful sort of simple chemistry to be able to do so. Your job now is to recognize that a carboxylic acid in the presence of alcohols, they can be as simple or as complex as you want, will give you an ester. And the whole process is reversible. So to get this to go to the right-hand side, get rid of this stuff. What happens if you want to go backwards? What happens if you start with the ester and you have to make the carboxylic acid? What do you do? Add water. How much? A lot, according to Mr. Apper. A lot. And what else do you need to add if you add the water? A little bit of acid catalyst, and that will go backwards. And then you play the same game. Maybe you need to get rid of the methanol here. Maybe that's lower boiling. Maybe you can boil that away, and you can take this to the backwards. So these systems now are nothing more complicated than anything we've seen, but they just look a little bit different each time. Again, we said that acid chlorides are very useful for producing esters. And we've got to be on, on our toes here. What's the, um, the pH of this system? If you were to measure this with pH paper, if you could, what would it be, acidic or basic? Acidic, right? pH less than 7. So lots of protons, lots of positive things. Now, if you move to this, what do you think? What do you think pyridine behaves as? It's a base. Now, it's not going to be as dramatic as, say, O minus, like it would be for hydroxide and methoxide, but that is a base, and it will have to go deprotonate something at some point. So what we do here is use this as a nucleophile. It will go after the carbonyl, 
we'll end up kicking the chlorine out through a tetrahedral intermediate, and then we'll have a HCl left over. And that HCl gets picked up by the pyridine. Don't forget pyridine is a six-membered ring. It's a benzene derivative, which has an N in there instead. It's a Huckel system. And the lone pair outside is able to be used as a base. I hate that pyridine, but OK, that's as good as it can get. Um, that's what happens, and the pyridine comes in after the reaction, after the substitution process. Very, very useful. Flashcard, sometime today, acid chloride plus an alcohol in the presence of pyridine gives you an ester. This is a reaction that most of you have seen. Do you benefit from it? I think most of you on a daily basis. Um, the saponification of esters. Now, things are going quite quickly here, and that's because people aren't stopping me, and I think it's fairly repetitive. But you ought to be trying to make decisions now. Look at these conditions. What type of condition does this tell you? Basic. What does that tell you about the intermediate species and the mechanism? Negative. It should be negative. And just keep an eye on that. It's a very simple rule to keep with you to try and have a go at these things. Otherwise, it can get, you can get lost. Now, saponification has all kinds of uses. I'll tell you about that in a second. What we're doing here, again, in a two-step process or a two um, procedure, two procedures back to back, is removing the OR group and replacing it with OH. And again, we could argue, well, maybe it does this. Maybe the OH comes in and it kicks out the OR and we do that. That's not what happens. We can prove that again by labeling. If you took an OH18 labeled, you find out that the oxygen ends up in the product. So it can't just be that mechanism. Down at the bottom is the classic process for what we call a saponification. The word saponification comes from the, the making of soap, right? Soap saponification, that's where it comes from. And you take typically an ester, and it could be a fatty acid ester from uh, an animal source, and you will be able to cook that up and then protonate to get to the product. This is an example of a mechanism that I think is indicative of where you should be. The others we've done today have been pretty straightforward. It's just nucleophile in, leaving group out, you're done. This is a little bit different. I have an ester, and I have hydroxide. Hydroxide can be a base or it can be a nucleophile. In this system, it's going to behave as both. Not at the same time. In the first step, the hydroxide goes in as a nucleophile. We attack the carbonyl. Now, why not protonate the carbonyl first? Because it's in the basic conditions I don't have any protons. So let's not protonate things if I don't have any protons. And that, again, that will be a criterion as we head towards the final. Did you get anything out of this class? If your mechanisms are completely you know, backwards like that, and you've got the acid-base stuff wrong, no, because you need to know that for later. What's this? Tetrahedral intermediates, right? This time it's negative because we're using bases and nucleophiles, therefore we have, low, we have high pH, and therefore we have um, negative intermediates. Now, once this thing breaks off, is that a good leaving group? Is OR- minus a good leaving group? No, unless you're under the conditions that allow it to be a good leaving group. And the conditions here are such that the pH is very high, maybe 9 or 10 or 11. And so you have purposely made that system that a pH, that negative species like OR- are allowed. Why? Well, you put hydroxide in. There's hydroxide. That's very much like OR-. So if you put hydroxide in purposely, it should make sense that anything negatively charged on oxygen should be OK at that pH. So we'll do that. We'll kick out the OR leaving group, and we'll end up over there. Now, this is where people get lost. We are still at that high pH. You are still under very basic conditions. Now, however heroic you are, you cannot simply dive into this mixture and save that carboxylic acid at this point. You can't do it, right? That base is going to get that proton, whether you like it or not, because you haven't neutralized anything yet. You're still under the basic conditions. Our carboxylic acid just, get, just got formed, very happy with itself. All of a sudden, boom, it got deprotonated because you can't stop that deprotonation of that pH. So this is not the product of that step. And this will get confusing, especially with chapter 22 coming up. That will inevitably deprotonate very quickly. So the product of this first step is actually this. It's the carboxylate salt. So what's the pKa of this carboxylic acid, approximately? Five. And what would the pKa of this material be once it's protonated? 16. So that right-hand side is heavily favored, right? And in fact, that's looking like an arrow that's not reversible. I'm going to refer to that as jumping off a cliff. Okay, that thing is not coming backwards. That thing is happy to be down there. Okay, energetically, the right-hand side is heavily, heavily favored. And that's it. So now if I want to make a carboxylic acid, what do I need to add? A proton. Something strong, something like H2SO4, 
HCl, something like that, to give this a proton back, be awake here. Okay, there's about 15 people who don't come to class. They're going to get absolutely battered on this next exam. The detail here is key. That first step, you end up with the carboxylate. A lot of people get lazy and they'll stop here. That's not the product. That's a misunderstanding of the, and a misinterpretation of the, um, of the mechanism. That is the product, but you don't get it there. You deprotonate, you get this, and then you quench, and that gives you the product. So yes, I have to draw it twice, because it gets formed twice. Kessler, you okay with that? You got a concerned look on your face. Lots of good stuff here. Exam next week, so make sure we're on top of this. Now, how do you prove this? Well, there's an experiment to do exactly that. You can start off with the uh, labeled material, and you can find out where the label ends up. If the label ends up in the piece that got lost, this had to behave as a leaving group. That's exactly what happens. Same mechanism at the top, simple two or three step process, kicking out and leaving group, and then quenching. That's all there is to it. So saponification is important. You've probably seen this at some point in your lives. I don't know, when I first taught this a while back, <laughs> I was about 35, he was about 36, he's about 52 now. Um, you've all seen this movie, right? If you haven't, you should. And the background to it is kind of fun because it's quite subversive. And basically, they're taking fat from a, a source, and they're turning it into soap, and then selling it back to the same people they took the fat from. It's very clever. Um, if you think about the possibility of, of how a soap works, you need a molecule that has two components. It has to have a polar end, which we will call hydrophilic, and it has to have a non-polar end, which we call hydrophobic. Now, I don't think I brought in my picture of my cell, but... Um, these things aggregate. If you mix this together in water, you'll find that you'll form sort of a, a spherical system in which all the polar things are outside. They've aggregated to outside. And all the non-polar things, which are these long chains, have aggregated inside. Okay? And you get this sort of very, very non-polar environment in the middle of what we call a micelle. We'll talk about them in a bit more detail in the late, last, last couple of chapters. So, Pierce, imagine you're a piece of dirt. Dirt is very non-polar. Where would you rather be? In the non-polar region with your friends or out in the water? In the non-polar region with your friends. So dirt basically finds its way into these micelles in the washing machine and, and sequesters itself in there and then gets washed away. That's how it works. But you can make these things. We've been making these things for thousands of years, at least hundreds of years. Uh, where's the most obvious example of these materials? Animals, cows, pigs, things like that, right? So don't waste anything. Use the fat. Saponify it by this type of chemistry. And you end up with things like sodium stearate, which was used for generations as soap. We have, you know, we're not so keen on that anymore. We have synthetic versions of this now, but that's how it works. So that's why we need these things. Uh, biochemistry, you'll learn about this in a bit more detail. You'll learn about these complex structures. There's a fat molecule, which is a triglyceride. And you cook this stuff up with base, and you end up with glycerol, which is useful, and you end up with soap molecules. All it is is a saponification process. It must be a Monday. Everybody's worn out. All right. You can also catalyze these things with acid. And you will save yourself an awful lot of time if you can identify acetals and their chemistry versus carboxylic acid slash esters and their chemistry. One has a leaving group, one doesn't. And what we did with the acetals, once we used them as blocking groups, is we put water in with acid and took it off. And we did the mechanism for that whole thing. So now I've got the other situation here, where I've got this ester, and I want to somehow, under acidic conditions, a, be able to replace the O-methyl group and put an OH on there. Again, if you're looking for one of the better grades in the class, you need to be able to think about this from first principles. pH, high or low? Low. What should I do first? Protonate something. So there's the first step, protonate something. When you get this stuff, it's like it's just it's the same stuff again and again. It just looks different. It's the same idea. Protonate. If I protonate this, what would I like to see drawn with this species that will help me understand why it's more reactive now? Resonance structures, I think so. And then we need some help, so that's where the water comes in. Don't forget we're going in this direction now, so we're hydrolyzing. You can bring in the water as a nucleophile. What would you describe that as? It's a tetrahedral intermediate. Then what's this process all about? Proton transfer, so that I simply swap the proton from one OH group to the O-methyl group. And once I'm there, 
I can lose the methyl, methanol as a good leaving group. There's my byproduct. And I get to this. I'd like to see resonance structures there, please, to show why that thing is stabilized or, or good. And then we'll lose a proton and end up with a carboxylic acid. That, my friends, is exactly the opposite of the Fischer esterification. Fischer esterification, you start here and you end up there. This is exactly the opposite. Save yourself some time and some pain by seeing that and organizing it in a way that you can, you know, it sinks in. Can you memorize this stuff? Sure, but it's painful. If you understand it, it's much more fun. Mikey. Well, think of it in a bigger sense. We've just put R here, right? What happens if R happens to be something you've spent months, not nay, years putting together? And that very expensive piece over here contains something that is base sensitive. And you went ahead and did a saponification reaction, and you just blew up everything you made because the base went after that as well. Or, on the other hand, if this thing over here, that's supposed to be um, a dollar sign. And on the other hand, if you had something that's acid sensitive, you don't want to be using acid there because it will chew that up as well. So you pick, you choose. And we'll have to do that as we head towards the final. Which are the more appropriate conditions to use in this particular case? So we can make esters, we can break them apart. Why would you want to do that? Why would you want to send them in different directions? Well, as you've seen, there are all kinds of esters available from nature, particularly from fruits. So if we can get them in large quantities, we can turn them into a carboxylic acid by doing this. And other examples, there are many carboxylic acids in nature that we can get hold of and turn them into esters. So it's necessary to have conditions to go in both directions. Plus, biochemistry is very good at that, using very simple materials like this to go backwards and forwards, depending upon what's needed to be done. I'm just going to keep going. All right. Now, the last thing to talk about in this chapter, I think, really, is amides. And they are the best of the lot. These are materials that hold proteins together, they hold uh, clothes together, they hold Kevlar together, and things like that. Amides are strong bonds. So we need to really know what's going on here. But again, it's repetitive. A lot of this is the same stuff. If you've got some idea about pH and some idea about the simple mechanism here, there's nothing tricky. Aminolysis of esters right here, what's that going to behave as? Leaving group, what's this going to behave as? Nucleophile, right? You'd think this is acidic or basic slightly basic, right? Ammonia. So a mechanism here, you might think about the nitrogen going in, forming an intermediate, this thing being booted out, and we end up with that. So you can certainly come up with a, a possible mechanism for how that works. Down at the bottom, we've got to be careful here. Esters are also reduced. We did this a little while ago, earlier today. If you use LAH, you get a primary alcohol. We will see soon, probably Wednesday, that if you start with an amide, you get a different outcome. This is something that is different that you need to make a note of. So these are useful. These are useful materials. Here we go with the uh, reduction of ester that we, did, we started with this actually today. Uh, we started with this hydride coming in, forming this intermediate species, giving an aldehyde, and then getting reduced down. That's the second time we've seen that today. Over here, how about we control that? How about we stop at the aldehyde? Well, we can use something called dibar. It's a very simple uh, aluminium derivative that has hydride attached. And again, the whole key to this is it's got one hydrogen. So if you see the one hydrogen attached, chances are it'll stop at the aldehyde. Dominic. Yeah. Nuclear file. Yeah. No, it can't be an SN2. It's going to go here. It's going to go to the it's going to be an acyl substitution. And again, thinking thinking about the final, you know, I'll probably ask you a question about how to prove a mechanism. Give me an experiment that shows how this how you know that this goes this pathway. We did that last semester, right, when we did the SN1, SN2. You told me that if you add more nuclear file to the SN2, it should go faster. If you add more nuclear file to the SN1, it shouldn't change. So we've done that type of thing. I'd like to do that again with these mechanisms. Yeah? So the proof is that you end up with the nitrogen attached here, and this has to behave as a leaving group. So now we've got a selective reagent, Dibar, to be able to do this with esters, to come down to the aldehyde oxidation state. Mechanistically, again, hydride goes in, kicks out the methanol, you stop there. Mr. Holman? Yes. Yes. Yes, yes. The problem with this chapter, that, that brings up a good point. The problem with this chapter that you will find as you study is organization. Because the problem is, you can go from 
Carboxylic acids to acid chlorides, from acid chlorides to esters, from esters to amides, from amides back to carboxylic acids, from carboxylic acids to anhydrides, from anhydrides to chloride. You can go all over the place. Yeah? But there's a logic to it, like I said at the beginning. You use those reactive things like chlorides and anhydrides to make the esters and make the amides, not the other way around, typically. So keep that in mind as you organize yourself. All right. Grignards we just did. Repeating ourselves here, I think. The idea that you need an excess of the grignard to get to the product. And you can see now that this goes twice. You form the ketone intermediate here, and that goes further end up for the tertiary alcohol. Those are things that you have seen. It might have been a while, but you have seen them and should be okay with them. I want to get to amides today. Now, I know some of you are thinking of graduate school and things like that, medical school and pharmacy school. Um, you need to be on, t you know, however hard you're working at the moment, you have to work harder. And if, if you're at the max now, it's going to push you. Um, a conversation over the weekend about what's going on at the medical school out there. And a student was talking to my wife, and, and the student said to them, your class in one week pretty much covered everything I'd covered in a year at YSU. One week in a year. Right? And that's just the way it is. So as we get more in involved here, and as biochem, you took biochem, right, Cole? It's just more and more involved. So you've got to, again, I keep saying this all the time, but you've got to start asking questions, getting some help, getting some guidance on how to do this, because it will get overwhelming. All right? Even, you know, if you're not going to go to graduate school, the upper division classes get more and more complicated, so get some help as you can. Now, I'm going to start this today. I've got a few minutes. If you didn't get your quiz on Friday, I've got your quiz here. You can pick that up. But I'm going to finish off this chapter with amides. And then I'm going to start 22 on Wednesday. And 22 to me is probably the most complicated chapter we've seen so far. We've got all sorts of examples. I spent yesterday uh, writing slides for my other class, and I was uh, kind of uh, amused to find out that penicillins are um, turned into cephalosporins naturally. I thought they were synthetic derivatives, but they're not. Uh, we see amides in these guys. What do you know about this bond right here? What do you know about that cycle? Strained, and that's, as you'll learn later, that's what leads to its activity. It opens up in part of its mechanism in terms of how it works. Uh, this is a polyamide. This is actually an amino acid derivative. You have all these amide bonds in here. And the, cep the, the cephalosporins, which are very similar in terms of their relationship, they just have a six-membered ring on the right instead of a five. You've got these amide bonds. Okay? And amide bonds are thermodynamically the strongest of the ones we've seen. So these are good systems. These are going to be uh, somewhat stable. If you're interested in chemicals in terms of maybe engineering, in terms of uh, some of the materials that are used to make things in, in society. e caprolactam is used to make nylon. I'll show you nylons at the end of the, the nylon system at the end of the uh, semester. But there you have the amide. Okay? That system then is bifunctional. You'll be able to open this thing up and make an acyclic system that has a carboxylic acid on one end and amine on the other end, and you can polymerize that. Where have you seen this stuff? RNA and DNA. All right? So the idea now, uh, I think thiamine is DNA, isn't it? And uracil is RNA. This is where chemistry, I think, gets to be fun because you can start to see. In biology, you tend to get acronyms and you tend to start to memorize stuff. It doesn't really mean anything because you can't see the pictures. This is where I sort of get, you know, this is the end of my comfort zone. I like to see these things, but then the, in the biology, uh, it all becomes an alphabet of UTACG, which means nothing to me at all. But the chemicals right there, you can see now we've got the amides involved in these uh, pyrimidine type systems. You've got two amides in both cases, and the only difference there is the methyl versus the hydrogen. We'll talk about those in more detail as we get there. So, I'm going to wrap up in a minute, but here is how we make amides. And we can make amides from all the other systems. We can't really make often all the other systems from amides because they're so stable. So this is the best place to go is to make an amide. And you'll see this slide earlier. You've got the most reactive systems here are the ones with the best leaving groups. And they're great at making amides. You can swap out those groups quite easily for nitrogen and make an amide. Esters, it's easy to make those things. We just showed that. And amides, they're the best. The least reactive, the most stable. So what you'll find now is these little arrows here mean something. You can go in each of these directions from each of these species above to the amides, but it's very difficult to go backwards. Okay? Very difficult. We might do one where we show how difficult it is, but it's very difficult to do that. And to get started, we'll talk about acid chlorides plus some nitrogen system to give the amide. And in this case, we need the two equivalents of the amine, or in this case, ammonia. What was the second equivalent useful? 
a base to pick up the extra proton, right? Easy enough there. So we've got this electrophile, we've got some nucleophile to add, and we've got the leaving group breaking off, and we end up with an amide like that. Later on, when I condense the last three chapters into a couple of weeks, and we talk about amides and polymers and some of the biological stuff you have to worry about, you can see now that you can make these more interesting by making them polyfunctional. And you can see here, if you take this material, you will couple these two pieces together to give the amide functional group. And then at this end, you can couple this with another carbonyl, and you can make that another amide, and you can keep doing that infinitely. And that will be called a polymer. And that's where many of these materials come from. So it's simple chemistry, nucleophilic acyl substitution, but taking it to a, a, a great extent, greater extent, making these reactions go again and again and again. Not quite there yet. In terms of hydrolysis of amides, well, I'm going to leave it at this slide and come back to this on Wednesday, but this is key here. Why do you need to heat this stuff up? If you use an acid chloride, you do it at room temperature below. Acid anhydride, room temperature below. Why do you heat this stuff up? Amides are so stable. Right, on that note, I'll see you in rest station in 10 minutes, and then um, ask some questions, because this is getting quite busy.